Um, and now I'm going to bring our last presenter on, Mr. Jawo Ba. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, from my end, um, Abdullahi Jawaba. I'm a lecturer at the College of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences, Pharmacology, and my background is pharmacy. But at the moment, I'm doing a PhD program in, at the Queen Margaret University in Scotland, Edinburgh, on global mental health. And my presentation here this afternoon will be on the mental health imp implications of COVID-19 on healthcare workers in Sierra Leone. It regards the background, the coronavirus disease, of course, as we all know, have, um, have an unprecedented implication in many countries around the world. Sierra Leone was no exception. And the government initiated response against COVID-19 even before the first index case in Sierra Leone by closing borders, canceling, um, closing the international airport, for which we only have one in Sierra Leone. And currently we have recorded 3,880 confirmed cases, 140 in treatment facility, 2,612 recoveries, 79 deaths, and 2% case fatality. Healthcare workers are exposed, as we all know, to traumatic events and other stressors, which may represent risk to their personal, family, and professional life. Yet, very limited availability of reliable data presents a major barrier in effectively responding to the needs of healthcare workers by government, local, and international partners. And uh, going back to the Ebola, during the Ebola crisis, we had about 307 healthcare workers that were infected in Sierra Leone. 221 of them died, which was 6.8% of our health workers in Sierra Leone. Because Sierra Leone, we have like a chronic shortage of health workers. We have maldistribution of health workers and also skill mix imbalance. So just highlight or buttress on that. In Sierra Leone, we have two psychiatrists serving a population of 7 million. We have no clinical psychologists in the public sector, just two that we have presently in private practice. We have just one hospital, um, psychiatric hospital, which dated back in, in, in the colonial era. And that um, psychiatric hospital is the only one serving the 16th district in Sierra Leone. We have 19 mental health nurses distributed across 16 districts. And we have just one mental health psychiatric, social work, psychiatric nurse. So this study basically provides a great opportunity for health workers to report their experiences, emotions, perceived needs, and resilience in an anonymous and secured way. The results will serve as a basis for organizations to take stock and, as appropriate, adjust existing or establish new programs and policies to support the well-being of their staff. Now, this study basically was like, um, the, in terms of the setting, Sierra Leone is situated in the west coast of Africa, flanked by the Atlantic Ocean and bordered by Liberia and Guinea. So basically, we are in the west of west of Africa, you know. So the country has a young, rapidly growing population of 7 million people. About 50.8% about 50 of them are female, 40.8% of them are less than 15 years, and 41% of them are li living in urban areas, 51% are basically illiterate, why 78% are Muslims, according to UNFPA 2018. More than 52.9% of them live below poverty line, and about 1.1 million of them live within the Western area of Auburn, in which Freetown, which is the capital city, is located. Now, the study design, basically, it was an online cross-sectional study using Kobo Collect. So basically, it was a universal of all healthcare workers that are eligible who be invited to take part in the study by conducting online survey, facilitated countywide coverage, and also allow them to integrate participating in the study into their work schedule at a place and time of their choice instead of taking that, them out of their work physically. So recruitment of participants and data collection, I constructed the online survey in English because English is the official um, language in Sierra Leone. And I pilot tested it in two rounds among healthcare workers in various districts. The survey took approximately about 45 minutes to fill one form and was launched in late January and open for completion by eligible participants. I sent emails to participants throughout the country 
which are healthcare workers using their various forums. And I also use various social media platforms, example of them, which is like WhatsApp. All healthcare workers with pin codes were eligible to participate. So we have basically healthcare workers that are volunteers. When they did the last survey in 2016, in terms of human resource for, health, for, for healthcare workers in Sierra Leone, about 50% of them were volunteers that we are not, that is, they are not having pin code, they don't collect salary at the end of the month. While 50% of them were on pin codes and they are the one that collect salary. So basically it's like pin code was one of the criteria that we use. So the study instrument basically that I used, I built like a social demographic um, questionnaire based on previous studies from literature. I also took into COVID-19 had any family member or relative or a colleague that have been infected before. And I also use like the Hopkins um, symptom checklist, which of which 10 questions look at anxiety. The last to act by Hugo in 1988 is like adding the 25 of them give us like a clear idea about the psychological distress of the individual. We also use the Malach burnout inventory, which look out, which um, takes into cognizance in terms of burnout, just as the first presenter highlighted. We look at um, a, um, emotional exhaustion, we look at depersonalization, and also, and also we looked at passion, pers personal accomplishment. The brief resilience scale also we use because we wanted to assess the resilience of the healthcare workers amid this pandemic. Statistical analysis, we use SPSS for data analysis for descriptive statistics. But as I'm presenting now, the data collection is still ongoing. And uh, we are also having a qualitative component, which is look at, looking at the coping strategies of these healthcare workers. Ethical approval, we apply for ethics approval to the Sierra Leone Ethics Research and Scientific Committee, and we are granted. And the online form also has like a participant information sheet at the front and also informed consent form. And we made it very clear that it is purely voluntary and individual to access before having access to the um, research. Now, this basically is like the social demographic data of, of, of the healthcare workers in terms of gender, age, religion, profession, their highest level of education, marital status, their salary, because their monthly salary is like per month. And we also ask them if they have like, if they have kids living with them and also if they are living with the elderly above 60 years, and if um, and where they are currently stationed in terms of like whether it is in the western area, northern province, east and southern province. We also looked at um, the COVID-related variables, looking at asking them, by asking them if they are frontline health workers and if they were directly involved in the Ebola response. That is, we are trying to assess whether being part of the Ebola response gave them some amount of resilience or give them added advantage and also if um, the pandemic have affected their spiritual life. We also ask them in terms of having pre-existing medical condition as healthcare workers, as we all know, that's one of the vulnerabilities or, or risk factors for, co for, for COVID-19 um, in terms of mortality. And also we ask them in the past one month if they have experienced any symptoms, that is we are trying to assess if they have like any somatic symptoms. We also ask them if they have like um, colleagues that lost their lives and also um, relatives that have lost their lives in the pandemic or they are infected and recovered or infected are currently isolated. We also ask them if they, were, if they have been stigmatized as in the case of the Ebola for being healthcare um, provider during this COVID, um, COVID pandemic. Now, when we use the instrument, it's like um, that, we, that I already highlighted, we realize that in terms of psychological distress, anxiety, depression, and resilience, we realize that the level of anxiety um, psychological distress, that's, that is when we had the 25 questions, according to Hogg in um, a paper that was published looking at breast cancer patients, we realized that 16.4% of these healthcare workers demonstrated symptom that is um, predictive of um, psychological distress. 16.4 also for anxiety, 20% for depression. And when you look at the resilience, we realized that it was 50-50, meaning that in terms of low and moderate but no, none of them had any high amount of resilience as healthcare providers. 
In terms of the burnout, when you use the mass large uh, burnout inventory, looking at emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, professional accomplishment, we realize that in terms of emotional exhaustion, we realize that um, over 54.5% 50, of them had low, while slight, slight, slight um, 43.6% of them had moderate, and 1.8% of them have had high. In terms of depersonalization, we have 70.9% of them had moderate, 14.5% high, and low was 14.5%. And we also look at personal accomplishment, which was the, the disappointing part of it. We realized that about all, all of them, 100% of them, had no sense of personal accomplishment. Now, I'm looking at putting into context in terms of the distribution of the health facilities where these health workers were working. We can see here that um, some of them were working in the private hospital, private surgeries, COVID-19 COVID con contact tracing centers, primary health units, and uh, public hospital was the highest second to the um, public health institution like malaria, TB, and HIV programs. Now, we also try to look at what are the stressors that um, these healthcare workers are, en are, are enduring. We are like top, of, top on the list was lack of adequate resources in terms of drugs, diagnostic equipment to take care of their patients, and also lack of recognition by the government as, what, as, as, was, as, as it was demonstrated during the onset of a pandemic because like we, there was, a slight a bit of delay in terms of our preparedness because healthcare workers were saying that they will not take part in the in the response if government failed to provide them with medical insurance because those that died during the um, Ebola epidemic, the healthcare workers, to my to the best of my knowledge, they were never they were if their family members were promised, but that promise was never fulfilled in terms of compensation. So as a result of that, a good, I mean, all healthcare workers, we are saying that they will not take part of the response, but government engaged them and it, um, a compromise was, was struck. So basically it's like, that is like in the, in the form of compensation for individual healthcare workers, if anything should go wrong. And during this COVID-19, we've also lost about five healthcare workers, three of them are medical doctors and the others are nurses. So we also have like lack of protective equipment that is like gloves, um, also lack of the PPEs, a lack of sanitizer that came toward in the list. And also we have lack of psychologic, psychological or psychosocial support for healthcare workers, which, is, which was very deplorable because um, during the Ebola epidemic, when 6.85% 6 of the healthcare workers died, that was one of the recommendations that psychological or psychosocial support should be provided for healthcare workers taking part in future pandemics. But basically that is to the best of my knowledge, often I have not been materialized. So economic and financial problems, lack of time to carry out other activities like studying, lack of recognition by management, excess workload, lack of direct direction by management, that is lack of vision, and lack of autonomy as a healthcare worker, relationship problems with um, colleagues within multidisciplinary teams, lack of confidence in terms of the um, IPC within the, their health facilities, and also lack of recognition by patients and care and care providers and also separation from family members for some of them that are working in district far away from their family. Now my conclusion here is like there is a need for improving mental health well-being of healthcare workers by focusing on stigma reduction because like 36.1 percent of them reported of experiencing stigma but most of the other parameters I use like I did like a bivariate analysis and I realized that, that they were not statistically significant with regards to like age, with regards to like marital, but marital status came out clearly. The data currently is not in these slides, but marital status came out clearly as an associated factor and single basically look um, turn out to be like a vulnerable factor compared to people that are married or cohabiting. So improving mental health, uh, mental well-being of healthcare workers and their social capital is very, very important. And also stigma reduction to mass media mobilization and community engagement and also equipping healthcare providers with protective measures, as in the case of the PPEs and the gloves and masks, as well as ensuring psychosocial support are provided for them to build and sustain their resilience. Now, in terms of recommendation, firstly, there should be an enabling working environment for healthcare workers, as I've said earlier, in terms of providing them with the PPEs, providing them with masks and sanitizers. And also, secondly, psychosocial support should be provided for them, focus on health workers 
as part of the preparedness and also to reduce the impact not only on their well-being but also on the health system at large. Stigma reduction also should be conducted or organized, mobilization, mass media and community engagement. These are my references. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Very eye-opening, especially trying to get a grasp of what's going on in different parts of the world. So I hope that was as eye-opening for everyone as it was for me. 